honored today to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ira Chalev. Mr. Chalev is a world-renowned executive coach and consultant and a recognized thought leader in the field of followership. His clients include some of the world's most prestigious and impactful companies and organizations, and we are truly privileged to have him with us today. Before inviting him up to the podium, I'd like to take a brief moment to share with you some of his more distinctive accomplishments. Mr. Chalup is the founding is the founder and president of Executive Coaching and Consulting Associates in Washington, D.C. He is chairman emeritus of the Congressional Management Foundation, a nonpartisan organization committed to helping members of Congress meet the evolving expectations of an engaged and informed 21st century citizenry. His now classic book, of which you will each be given a copy today, entitled The Courageous Follower, Standing Up To and For Our Leaders, is in its third edition and has been translated into half a dozen languages. He is also the co-editor of The Art of Followership, How Great Followers Make Great Leaders in Organizations, which is part of the Warren Bennis Leadership Series. Mr. Chalup was cited in the Harvard Business Review as one of the three pioneers in the emerging field of followership studies. He is the founder of the Followership Learning Community at the International Leadership Association and is also on the board of the International Leadership Association. He has been named one of the top 100 best minds on leadership by Leadership Excellence Magazine. He is an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown University and a frequent workshop presenter in leadership development programs at universities, federal agencies, and in the private sector. His coaching experience includes having worked for three years with the Navy's Nuclear Strategic Support Program. His speaking engagements have included the Society of American Military Engineers, the National War College, the Director of National Intelligence's Leadership Forum, the Navy's Public Affairs Officer Symposium, and many Office of Personnel Management programs with DOD personnel well represented. We are truly honored to have Ira Chalup with us this afternoon, and please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Thank you very much. Am I coming across well here? Okay. Uh, the honor is mine, and I appreciate being invited. I'm sorry that uh, Colonel Athens can't be here as I understand the invitation came from him after he read my book, uh, The Courageous Follower. So we are going to, in about 30 minutes, try to cover about 20 years of what I've learned on this topic. So, uh, so bear, bear with me. And the first thing we have to address is why the subject of followership. I suspect that when you uh, did your applications uh, for, for the uh, Naval Academy, you were asked about your leadership qualities and not your followership qualities. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, okay. How many of you grew up wanting to be the best follower you could be? In our culture, that rings uh, as a strange question. And yet, the, what is the one thing that a leader needs in order to be leading? They need at least someone following them. Or no matter what they're doing, they're not leading. So, in my estimation, it doesn't make sense in our culture to honor the subject of leadership and disparage the subject of followership. They are both part of the same process. And the error is that in our culture, we have come to view the word follower as a personality type. That is not how it's being used here. It's as a role that you play at times, at times you lead, and at times you follow. <clears throat> and then the question becomes, why courageous followership? Now, I'm probably going to do something very impolitic here uh, by, by reading uh, you some, uh, an email I received uh, one week ago uh, from the, um, from the uh, US Army Command and General Staff College. So um, nevertheless, a little inter-service rivalry probably isn't a bad thing to create here. This, uh, this was the, uh, uh, Lieutenant Commander uh, Paul Berg, who taught the first class on followership at the, uh, at the Command and General Staff College. And I asked him for his uh, experience there. I'm going to read you a couple of paragraphs, as I think it frames the issue in, in, a, in essence why uh, Colonel Athens probably wanted me to address you. 
Uh, it says, sir, after I introduced your five follower dimensions, and we'll talk about that, most of the students realized they had been living with this their entire careers, but they did not associate it with the formal term of followership. Most of the students' emotions were, quote, why haven't we talked about this before in our professional military education? And, quote, this is as important as talking about leadership. We discussed during reflection the current failures of our senior officers in the Army. The students realized that it was not just individual failure by the officer, but also the subordinate staff officers who knew what the boss was doing. That discussion created disbelief that subordinate uh, senior staff officers who knew about unethical behavior did not have the courage to dissent to their boss because their loyalty was self-centered individual future promotion and not toward the organization, uh, in this case, the Army. So I think that frames the issue here, why, why we're talking about this uh, today. So if you look at this uh, representation of an organizational chart, although you never see it uh, depicted this way, in fact, this is what is happening at every level of the organization chart. You're playing a leader role and a follower role. And if I ask you, is the uh, <clears throat> Secretary of Defense a leader or a follower? The answer, of course, is they, he has to be a leader, but he better be a follower or we have a constitutional crisis. So again, e all the way up and down the chain of command, we have both roles. Now, what I've done in my work is for a moment to step back from hierarchy, and we're going to get right back to hierarchy uh, because it's you know the water in which you swim, if you will. But the uh, way that in my work we conceive or reconceive the leader-follower relationship is that followers don't serve leaders. Rather, followers and leaders serve the common person pur purpose or mission. They are both there to serve the mission within a framework of agreed on values. And each party is completely responsible for serving the mission and the values. Now within that, we then have to look at how does hierarchy come into play here. Now, um, a relationship of contemporary leadership scholarship shows or, or, or views leadership not as a top-down activity, but as an interactive activity uh, of mutual relationship between followers and leaders. And I think those of you who've had uh, long-term careers uh, with, within the Navy and elsewhere, you will recognize that you have both influenced, been influenced from above, and you have at times influenced upward. And that is, in reality, how uh, leadership occurs, particularly when it's good leadership. So um, hierarchical structure is not the problem. Hierarchical structure is absolutely Im imperative in order to decide who can sign off ultimately on the weapon systems, who can sign off ultimately uh, uh, on the plan of battle, etc. That is, uh, without hierarchical structure, you would have chaos and, and you would have paralysis. That is not the problem. But there is a distinction between hierarchical structure and hierarchical relationships. Uh, and it's made by these two authors in their book, Don't Kill the Bosses, Escaping the Hierarchy Trap. And hierarchical relationships are the internal rules of behavior between those at different levels of authority. So we all carry these internal rules. They start in our early education, in our families, in our cultures, and we carry them. Not, we don't always fully appreciate what that rule set is, but we all have them. How uh, we address upwards, how we address downwards. Now I'm going to tell you a story. Again, I'm going to take this story from the Army. It's not that I don't have stories from the Navy on this, but the stories from the Navy that I have were always given to me uh, third hand or second hand. And I could not tell if they were teaching stories or, and therefore apocryphal or actual stories. Whereas the story I'm about to tell you from, from the Army is an actual, uh, the, the individual who told me the story was the officer involved here. And he was a lieutenant and he reported to a captain who was uh, very rigid. And he would report every morning to the captain. The captain would give him his 10 priorities for the day. And he would salute and, and leave. And if he had something he thought should be done, he would um, 
he would uh, tell the, uh, the captain, and the captain would say, you do my 10 priorities, and if you can fit in your 11th, you do that. Yes, sir. Well, the captain rotated out. A new captain came in, a lieutenant reported for duty, and the captain gave him an order for the day. He saluted, turned to leave, and the captain said, hold on. Did what I just tell you make sense to you? Yes, sir. He said, did it really make sense to you? And he said, well, sir, no, it didn't fully make sense because of, and the captain said, we have to get something straight. I cannot have you leaving here if I give you an order that does not make sense. You have to let me know. And, he, and, and the lieutenant said, yes, sir. He said, no, that's not good enough. We're going to practice this. I'm going to give you an order, and you're going to tell me, sir, that's BS, sir. And the lieutenant said, sir, I can't do that, sir. And he said, we're going to practice this. And so he gave him this order, and uh, the lieutenant said, I said, that's BS, sir. <laughs> Couldn't even get the words out of his mouth. And the, the captain made him practice it until he could say, clearly, sir, that's BS, sir. He said, fine, you're dismissed. OK, a few weeks go by. Lieutenant comes in, and the colonel is there. Uh, talking to the captain. The colonel's nephew had taken a jeep and the MPs had caught him. And the colonel was trying to work out a, a, a way to make this go away. And so the, the uh, captain explained the situation to the lieutenant and the lieutenant said, sir, that's BS, sir. And the colonel said, what did he just say? And the, uh, the captain said, sir, it's okay, I'll deal with this. And he put his arm around the lieutenant, and he walked him to the door, and he said, you did well, now get out of here before he kills you. <laughs> now, that's an example, though, of having to um, relearn or reexamine the internal programming so that when an order is given that, in fact, is not based on good information or is not supporting the values, that you have the capacity to say so because you, you are responsible, no matter who gives the order, you are responsible for your action in carrying out the order. Now, of course, tremendous good judgment has to be used here, and this will not be an everyday occurrence, but that's all the more reason why this needs to be examined, because um, as uh, you, you were saying uh, over the lunch table, we were saying uh, when you don't use celestial navigation, you lose it. Well, when you don't practice the um, ability to question, you lose it, and sometimes that has serious consequences. So what's happening here is this. This is a, just a, a very quick graphic here. Um, we, get, we get the subject of feedback. So someone takes an action, it has a result. If the result is negative and they get feedback on it, they don't like the feedback, but now they've got data and can correct their actions, and that is how learning occurs. That is how all of you become better officers. That is how also how your officers become better officers. What goes wrong here is that because of the internal relationship rule sets um, and culture, uh, if a leader takes an action and it's not a, 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 a well thought out action, then two things can happen. Either the person in the subordinate follower role can self-censor for all of the obvious reasons why you might self censor in that situation, or the senior officer, if, if the uh, person in the, f in the subordinate role has the courage to give honest, candid feedback, the person in the senior role could screen that out because of their rule set. Either way, you now have a gap occurring where no learning is happening, and therefore you get continued poor action. That's what we're trying to correct here, is while respecting hierarchy there is still a candid flow of information that will allow the data needed to improve um, behavior and, and decision making and action. Now, the danger of interrupted feedback is not just personal, it has you know, serious operational consequences. Um, for those of you old enough like myself to remember this film, which was you know, a star-studded film about Operation Market Garden in World War II, when a lot of decisions were made that really uh, should have been questioned because they had um, 
they, they did not, in retrospect, in analysis, seem to be good decisions in terms of logistics and assessment of the enemy uh, ca capabilities and, and positions. Uh, but because of this internal rule set, they were not said clearly enough, and the expression entered into our lexicon of we may be going a bridge too far, and in fact they went a bridge too far, and it was not ultimately a, success, a successful action, and uh, it could be argued that it delayed the uh, c conclusion of the war by months, which meant um, tremendous numbers of additional casualties. So this can be very, very you know, serious business that we're talking about here. Let's look at why does this happen. Okay, well, one of, one of the reasons this happens, uh, we can go to Maslow. And Maslow's hierarchy of uh, human needs and motivations tells us that the need to belong, the need to be part of the in-group is very, very strong. And if you look at the next level above the social needs, you see that's where achievement and self-esteem lie. And I will argue um, that's the level from which honor uh, ha and courage and commitment occur. One has to be able to rise above the level of need for social uh, acceptance at times in order to do the uh, honorable and the courageous thing. So let's look a little bit further at, at this. Now, I, I'm going to do a little uh, survey here. Um, and I want you to ask, uh, I want you to help me out. Uh, I want to ask you, in your, in, in your education, have you ever encountered uh, Solomon Ash's experiments on conformity? If you have, please raise your hand. I am so pleased, I am so pleased to hear this. Okay, because I, I was not sure it was entering into the curriculum. So for those of you who uh, are not familiar with it, this was an experiment in which the subject thought he was part of a group of seven people. In fact, the six others were confederates of the researcher. They would be shown a, uh, a line, and they would be asked to, uh, to identify which line in the second set it matched. And the first couple of answers, everybody gave the obvious answer. And then thereafter, they gave a wrong answer, which was blatantly wrong. And this, uh, the, 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 the uh, experiment went through a set of like 21 questions, 14 of which were blatant mismatches. And 25%, uh, 75% of the subjects at least once gave the blatantly wrong answer. And when they were asked afterwards why, there was a variety of uh, responses, such as they, uh, when everybody else was giving a different answer. They, they were always the last one in this experiment. It was rigged that way. Uh, they lost confidence in, in their own uh, perception, or they just didn't want to stand out. This is something you can relate to. It is hard. It takes courage to stand out against a peer group um, or, or, you know, or a hierarchical group. So this is important information. We have to understand that we do have a tendency to conform. And sometimes that, I mean, most of the time, that works fine. Sometimes that is not, uh, does not give us the best uh, ethical or operational results. Now, I'm going to again ask you another question. Uh, in your curriculum, how many of you have come across Stanley Milgram's experiments on compliance with authority? Virtually everyone in this room. I am so delighted to hear this. Um, so what I have found is that uh, in those um, universes where people do have ex uh, experience with uh, these experiments that were done at Yale in the early 1960s, they are aware of the salient fact that um, two-thirds, you know, again, the experiment, as you recall, was set up so that the subject didn't know that he was the subject. Um, and he thought that the L here, the learner, was the subject. And he was told that this was to, um, to see the correlation between how could we accelerate learning. It seemed like a, a, a valuable experiment to be conducting. But the problem was that he had um, a row of switches that went from uh, 15 volts to 450 volts. And the uh, subject, uh, the learner, the, the false subject, was an actor. And at 150 volts, he would start to display uh, real discomfort. At 300 volts, he would, he would demand the, the experiment continue. And uh, 
the, res the, the experimenter always said, and, and the important thing was here that the, that the true subject um, often became very uncomfortable. So this was not that they were sadistic or that they were unfeeling, but uh, they became very uncomfortable about continuing. But the experimenter who was dressed in a lab coat and a clipboard and therefore had the uh, symbols of authority said, the experiment requires that you continue. That's all that they were allowed to say. And therefore there was no coercion, there was simple authority. And um, the experiment repeated over and over again t in different cultures, different socioeconomic classes, different settings, two-thirds of people complied all, uh, over 300 volts and often to 450. Now, the important information, which I don't know if it's um, still being uh, looked at in depth, is that Milgram did a, a range of experiments to see how could we reduce the uh, inappropriate compliance. And one of the ways in which he found, in fact, the most effective way he found, where 90% refused to comply to the, to the destructive order, was when one or two of the Confederates said they would not continue. In other words, the subject was told there were three, three of them that were uh, responsible for uh, for giving the questions and marking the wrong answers and pulling this, the, the levers. And when one of the Confederates said, I can't go on with this, then the compliance rate got lower. When two Confederates said they refused to go on, the compliance rate by the true subject dropped to 90%. Why is this important? It's important because you, if, in the rare but important case, when you're in a situation where there is an order that for whatever reason is not a correct order to follow, the, um, you may not be the first person, you may not be the most courageous follower to say, sir, I cannot follow that order as it is given. Uh, but, it, but if someone else has that courage and takes a stand, recognizing that the second follower and then the third follower are what makes all the difference. And um, again, when you get the book that um, you're going to be given, and I'm grateful that it'll be given to you because those of you who are interested can read in more depth on the topic, you will find that the dedication to this book is to a military set of events in which someone had to make a, a decision, a life and death decision, to not follow an order. And this is, this is the kind of situation in which rarely, but occasionally and critically, uh, you may be faced and therefore um, the Stockbridge Center, of course, is mission is to help you uh, have the, uh, the preparedness to deal with ethical situations. Okay, um, once you decide you need to speak, uh, well, you have, you, everybody knows you have to choose your battles, but the, that doesn't tell you which battle to choose. So um, here's one way to think about it. If the leader's behavior or the order is just minorly flawed and it's, uh, you know, it irritates you a little bit, frustrates you, uh-uh, that's, that's, that's just professionalism, you deal with it. On the other hand, if you, if you wait until the flaw is so large uh, that the mission is in danger, the command is in danger, the program is endangered, or the career is endangered, it's too late. Doesn't, doesn't help to speak up then. The point of effectiveness is somewhere between when you see um, a, a, a decision or behavior that is impeding the ability to achieve the mission or approaching the ability to endanger the mission. That's the productive time to speak up. That's where you have to make your moral choice at that point. Am I, are we at that point? Okay, now I need to speak up. If you make that choice, then you have to decide what voice will you use in order to speak effectively. And there are three components to an effective voice and language that you use. You have to get your leader's attention. Leaders are very busy people, and they are uh, immersed in priorities. And you have to speak up in a way that will get their attention. Secondly, you then have to make your point effectively. That's going to be based contextually, but um, if, it's, if it's a database situation, you better be prepared to make that argument quickly and solidly. And you have to do it in a place and time 
and language to preserve the language, uh, to preserve the relationship with that leader. Obviously, um, you do have to you know, live in units and uh, c you'd never want to, if at all possible, to embarrass a leader, yet you must take the action needed for mission success. So the, the, the greatest example we have of this in our culture comes out of the aviation industry, where in the 1970s we had a rash of fatal crashes, and the analysis showed that the main, uh, the main reason behind those crashes was that a member of the crew saw something wrong, an anomaly, they didn't speak up because they assumed the captain saw it too, or they did try to speak up, but they didn't speak up assertively enough. The captain was preoccupied with checklist items, and the, uh, the crew member did, did not speak up in a way that got the captain's attention, and unfortunately, the painful black box recordings showed the last minutes of that aircraft's life. So uh, it, to compensate for that, the, um, the training that is called CRM, Crew Resource Management, I understand there's a bridge resource management equivalent of it now, was designed in order to uh, help crews to understand that in addition to that it is everybody's responsibility, situational awareness, it is also your responsibility to speak up assertively enough in order to get command's attention in that situation. Now, um, in, in order to do that, you have to, it's helpful to understand, we all know what assertive talk sounds like, but I'm not sure, again, I'd be interested to just see, has anybody encountered the subject of mitigating language in your training? No, okay. This is a term that comes out of linguistics. Mitigating language is language that you use to devalue uh, some of the weight of what you're saying. It's sometimes thought of as diplomatic language. If you're speaking to a senior officer, uh, you don't want to be presumptive. So you may, uh, you may couch what you're saying in um, terms that are somewhat self-deprecating. For example, you might say, sir, I, knew, I know that I'm new here, uh, and therefore I may not have all the data, but I thought I should bring this to your attention. So you have used some mitigating language there. In, um, in those kinds of situations, mitigating language is appropriate. In a situation where the risk is serious and command is not seeing the risk, it can be deadly. And you have to know when to shift from mitigating language to assertive language. So this is an example that, that uh, if we had a little bit more time, I'd walk you through an exercise here. But just imagine for a moment that you're sitting around a table and uh, you're outranked by everyone at the table and you hear something that you think contains serious operational risk. Now just for a moment recognize how difficult it's going to be for most of us to speak up when nobody else is speaking up who has more experience and outranks us. Yet, what we learn from CRM is that the only fatal mistake is not to speak up. So therefore, you have to think about what language will you use to put your question, your observation on the table. And you can do that using mitigating language, um, as, as I just uh, uh, gave an example. But let's say now that the response you get seems to not have heard, uh, understood the risk that you're trying to um, ask about. Now get that this is now much harder to put it on the table again. The officer has already responded. And yet again, the only potentially fatal error is to not make yourself clearer. So again, you can take it upon yourself. I'm sorry, sir, I may not have made my question clear enough. Let me uh, pose it again. You see, you're still accepting responsibility and therefore some mitigating language. Now, as um, we go along, uh, when I do this as an exercise, uh, I, I ask the, um, the group to say, well, what if the, uh, the response you get is, yes, you're right, that risk exists. We've examined all the other options. They all contain risk as great as that. And therefore, we've made this decision, and this is how we're going to um, try to manage that risk. What is your response there? Your response there is, yes, sir, how can I help? Because leadership is never without risk. You're not trying to eliminate risk. You're trying to make sure that command is aware of the risk that you can see from your perspective. Now, if the response, on the other hand, that you get is showing that the risk is really not understood, that's where you have to be willing to shift to assertive language and potentially 
even to um, the language and ethical stance. Um, you know, once in a while, when I uh, coach at the um, at the uh, nuclear submarine support program, and there's a, there's a decision document going around. Once in a while, a mid-grade officer says, "I cannot sign off on this, sir. If you choose to override me, obviously you can sign off on this, but I can't sign off on it, and here's why." And it's absolutely um, incumbent on you to be. Um, clear about your reasons for doing that. That is what courage and ethical uh, commitment require. So uh, based on that, I have developed a five-point model of courageous follow behaviors. Because I want to leave time for questions, I'm not going to elaborate on the model, but because you will have the book, the book is organized around these five sets of behavior. And uh, it's not a book that you have to read cover to cover. Uh, I would suggest you read the first chapter to get oriented. And then if you find yourself dealing with one or more of these issues, then you can go straight to that chapter. There's a lot of strategies and script that you can think about using, um, tailoring them to the substance of your situation. Out of this, we get, uh, I also offer that there are followership styles. Again, you know that there are leadership styles you have probably had some assessments on your leadership style and have learned uh, what its strengths are and, and how to compensate for it. But you probably have never thought about or been given language for your followership style. And the model that I use takes two vectors, the intensity of support for the leader, the intensity uh, of willingness to question uh, or challenge a proposed um, action and the combination of those is what produces the different styles. Again, you can uh, look at these in the book. They're elaborated on. But the, um, the point that I want to make here is that most of you, uh, the, bottom, the bottom half of this is where there's low support. I doubt that uh, anyone in this room actually would fall into those quadrants. But where many of you will fall is in the high support, low willingness to question or challenge. That's the implementer style. Implementers keep the world running. Uh, leaders love implementers. Implementer, it's great for your career path to be seen as an implementer. Um, you're low maintenance. If the job can get done within the resources that you've been given, it will get done. You will get it done. So what's the problem? The problem is that if there is, uh, if a leader has created a culture in which it is only safe and valued to be an implementer, then if he or she is about to make a serious mistake, there isn't anyone around who will speak up assertively enough to tell them that they should really reconsider before they, they make that um, decision. So we call that the partner style. And when I um, was interviewing um, several uh, naval officers and junior officers for another talk I gave, um, yeah, this is one of the quotes I got here. You know, the admiral called me a bulldog. <laughs> I was nervous when talking to him. I, you know, I nearly got fired four times. Um, but over time, he came to value my counsel. So to the degree that you're willing to be candid, even though there is risk, that's why it takes courage, um, you will, if you're right and you're good at what you do, you will earn uh, the... Um, the, the, the respect of your leaders, of your senior leaders, and you will become more of a partner. The, uh, but you have to find the courage within you to speak up. And this is different than physical courage because it's social courage. And I have found over the years that people draw courage from different sources. We don't all draw our courage from the same source or, or in different contexts we draw courage from different places. Um, you know, junior officer said, I was nervous standing up to people. It scared me to death, but I knew it was right. Well, where did, you know, you don't need courage if you don't have fear. You just do what you need to do. It's courage is what uh, is needed in, uh, in the face of fear, okay? So when you feel nervous about speaking up, you have to think, where do you go for that courage? It can be from your values, your values... Um, as an officer, your values um, 
as a, a person of faith, your values as an American citizen. It can go just for care for the group and leader. You do not want to see them fail. It can be a more cold calculated risk reward assessment. What are my chances of making a difference here? And fair enough, uh, if I have some chance, I'm going to take it. The um, professional standards are the documented source of courage. If you're an engineer, if you're a medical person, if you're a financial controller, and you see um, procedures being uh, violated, then you can fall back on the professional standards as uh, a base for speaking up. Sometimes it's a role model. Sometimes it's somebody in your family who did something so difficult that you think when you're in a tight spot, you think, if he could do that, I can do this. For other people, it's their life experiences. Sometimes you've done something so difficult and you have survived that you realize, I can survive this too, and I will, I will find the courage to do what's, what's necessary here. So I'm going to invite you all in your own time to actually reflect on that, maybe as, even as a, as a personal exercise. Where do you go? when you need the social courage in relation to your peers or your superiors. Um, one, of the, one of the officers uh, left me with this quote, when they try to shoot the messenger, take a deep breath, absorb the response, and discuss the issue rationally. You know, when you say something that isn't going to be popular, you're likely to get a blast back. Be prepared for that. Don't let it throw you. Hold your ground and come back with the data that's needed for the senior officer to e evaluate the situation. I want to um, leave you before I uh, invite questions to now talk to you as leaders. And as leaders, see, uh, uh, when I talk to you in your follower role, I'm saying you need to find the courage to speak up. When I talk to you in your leader role, I want to tell you you need to reduce the courage that the people who report to you need in order to speak up. You, it's your job to make it safe for candor, okay? And we live in a culture where um, we all know we have a blind spot in our automobiles and we, you know, we're, we're organized around our automobiles. So what do we always do before we change lanes to the left? We always look over our shoulder, always. And we know if we don't, splat. So I am, I'm suggesting to you that as a leader, you have to recognize that you may have a blind spot. And the, di and the difference, and, and this is a discipline. If you go in and you say, this is what we're going to do, recognize that it will be difficult for people to push back. Whereas if you go in and you say, this is what we need to do, this is the plan I have. Do I have a blind spot? Am I missing something? Now you've invited that feedback. And if there is a sand trap there, you're going to get it and avoid it, okay? So that, that's, a, that's a methodology and a discipline. Uh, so lastly, when you, um, because you recognize from your own experience that speaking up the chain of command isn't always easy, you look for an opportunity where, when someone does speak up, and particularly with a divergent view, that you validate that. And this is particularly um, you know, useful when you're, when you're a senior officer and you have uh, um, junior officers around a table. If you ask for feedback, start with the most junior officer because now then they are not having to uh, deal with the politics of what their senior officers have just said. They can be candid. And if they say something that you know and everybody knows is against the prevailing wisdom, rather than shoot it down, that's a great opportunity to say, um, I appreciate you putting that on the table. I can't buy what you're saying yet. You're going to have to convince me more, but I appreciate you're putting it on the table. You're creating a, an atmosphere of candor, and that is where ethics and courage and commitment thrive. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to just end off with one more quote here. It's a little uh, too far for me to, to read from there, so why don't you just read it? I, I thought that this was, uh, this was from the Air Force, so I'm being uh, service agnostic here, I guess. Uh, but I thought this was a very astute quote about that this is the time in your life to build that courage because at the very most senior levels, the political forces are much greater and it becomes harder to stand up for the right thing if you haven't developed that 
that uh, courage muscle, that reputation, uh, that way of being uh, in, in, within the uh, chain of command that you're in. So uh, those are the, uh, the messages that I want to leave you with in the time we have. Uh, we have about five or ten minutes for any questions or, or comments if you want to um, you know, give a, 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 your own example of something or push back on something, please, please let's do that. And here's your opportunity for courage as well. <laughs> I know I, I, it was a fire hose. I, I, I really uh, put a lot into you there, but let's, let's uh, take a question. Sir. Yes, sir, what would you say to a leader who might equate the solicitation of feedback from their subordinates before making a decision as a reflection of indecisiveness, which in our line of work can have very negative effects on morale and the confidence that one subordinates places in their leadership. How do you get past that perception and fear of being indecisive as a leader? By, are we consensus builders? Uh, he, here's, my, uh, here's my take on it. Uh, particularly in, in the entire world, but particularly in the service, you are becoming more and more specialized. And the people under you are becoming the experts, um, you know, in the cybersecurity, in the weapon systems, et cetera. And it's very difficult for a general officer to have the depth of knowledge that the people who are actually, um, you know, in those posts have. So I don't, I personally don't see it as indecisiveness. I see it as a responsible command to solicit input and then, you know, make a decision based on the competent input that you have gotten uh, f from those uh, professionals. Uh, because as you know, these days, uh, success is utterly dependent on the quality of the teaming. It's no longer based on, on an individual action, particularly shipboard, uh, you, you know, where you, you are so um, interdependent on each other. I, I, does, is that a reasonable answer in this culture, I guess, is my question. Uh, it's a reasonable answer, sir. I think that the, the pushback that one might give to you is that in some instances, perhaps not applicable to every uh, warfare designator, but hesitation can sometimes be the enemy in and of itself. Um, and to the extent that that feedback could imply uh, some hesitation, bad consequences sometimes result from that. But I think your points are very well taken also. Well, I, and, and I, I absolutely agree with you. It's contextual. For example, one of the, when I do that exercise on what kind of voice you're going to use, if, if, Captain, if you're on the airplane with Captain Sully and the four engines just blew out and he says, you know, we're going to land on the, on the Hudson River, that's not the time for a discussion. Uh, that's the time to, you know, say, yes, sir, how can I help? So it, it is contextual. On the other hand, sometimes there is a life and death uh, situation again. I'll refer you to the uh, uh, to the dedication of my book, where a um, junior officer was ordered to fire at a certain point, and he felt that that point was occupied by our own troops, and he refused the order. And in fact, uh, the hearings that uh, pursued found that he was right. Uh, and actually, the reason I particularly made this a um, dedication was that instead of being penalized, he was actually awarded a medal for the courage to not follow the order in that situation. But he had to be right, because otherwise you're absolutely right. It, you know, if, if he had um, been wrong, then there could have been other casualties based on uh, the uh, hesitation. So uh, this is, they're not necessarily easy answers here. Uh, again, courage is needed in either direction here. Is that it? Okay, well, let, me, uh, let me tell you that I will be at the table there. For those of you who have to run off to class, I pre-signed some of the books. They're, they're on the side of the table I won't be on. For those of you who might want to ask a question or want a uh, personal endorsement on the book, I'll, I'll be happy to do that if you have the time before you have to go to your next class. Again, I want to thank uh, the, uh, the center for inviting me here and uh, for the uh, warm reception I've been given. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you for sharing your experiences and wisdom with us this afternoon on behalf of the Stockdale Center. We have a gift we'd like to present to you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we truly do appreciate it. Thank you very much. It, thank you.